Hi everyone, it's time to talk about all of the books that I read in August. I will list the titles in the description box down below if you miss any and you would like to go and find out more. So firstly, I'm just looking at this pile here, it's quite big. <laughs> um, I'm going to start with the Women's Prize shortlist, which I reviewed as part of my job working for Toast. I don't think that article is up yet as I'm filming this, it's not. But when it is up, I'll link it in the description box down below because they're doing an amazing giveaway where you can win all of the shortlisted books, which is a pretty good giveaway. So if you're interested in winning those, once that is up, if you comment below my article talking to us about the books or the prize or what you've been reading recently, then they will enter you into that giveaway, which is open internationally. Anyway, let me talk about the books. So I'd already read two of them. So I revisited those before I was reviewing them. And those were Hamlet by Maggie O'Farrell and Girl, Woman, Other by Bernadine Evaristo. And I have spoken about them at length on this channel. I've also done an interview with Maggie O'Farrell and with Bernadine Evaristo before. And I'll link those in the description box down below if you missed them and you'd like to go watch them. I interviewed them because I adore their books. And unfortunately, is it unfortunate? I don't know. It's just a little bit of a shame when you're reading a shortlist and you're hoping to uncover and discover some books you absolutely fall in love with and then it turns out that the ones you love the most are the ones you'd already read. <laughs> so in brief that's what happened to me. So I adore Girl, Woman, Other and Hamlet. I'm not sure which one is going to win because I really I do think it's going to be one of those two. I may be proved wrong, I'm often proved wrong when it comes to prizes but I think it's probably going to be one of those two novels and I'm not sure who I want to win more, probably the Bernadine Evaristo, um, though Maggie has never won the Women's Prize and um, Girl, Woman, Other, I think because of the book and other prizes has been celebrated more rightly so because it's amazing, it's hard to know what kind of things the judges think about when they're deciding on winners. Anyway. Those are my favourites, if you haven't read them, go read them. I've now read Girl, Woman, Other three times in six months. That's how much I adore it. The others on the shortlist, we had Weather by Jenny Offal. This one seems to be a bit of a Marmite book. Also, I must apologise because I think in the past, lots of people have said to me, you should read Department of Speculation. Yes? Is that her previous book? Department of Speculation. You would love it. But I read a few years ago a book, if I can find it, I'll put it on the screen. If not, it remains a mystery. I read a book very similar in title to the Department of Speculation, which I really didn't like. And I always thought that was that book. It's not, they're two different books. So I'm sorry if I've said that I didn't like Jenny Offal before, because I've never actually read her before now. Now I have, but I also didn't love this either. So that's unfortunate. It's a very slight book um, and it's about a librarian. I remember a Neil Gaiman quote, he once said, I'm uh, not quoting perfectly here, if you want an answer Google will bring you back hundreds of thousands of them but a librarian will bring you the right answer. So our protagonist in here is trying to be that librarian. Lizzie is answering questions that have been sent to her old mentor Sylvia for her podcast about climate change and the end of the world. So she is putting down her fragmented thoughts about her life and slotting in like jigsaw pieces her answers to these questions or her thoughts on these questions about catastrophe and the end of the world and this is a really funny book in places because it shows that disaster and catastrophe can be yes the end of the world and worrying about climate crisis and all of that but sometimes it's your young son telling you he doesn't think that you're a very nice person and questioning whether because of that you may even be his mother at all and there's this such a funny paragraph in this where she says um, but he was just a young child so I tried not to let it bother me too much and now years later I only think about it I don't know maybe once or twice a day and I cackled at that I just thought it was so funny but ultimately this book just didn't seem to come together at all and maybe the point is that there are no answers and everything is overwhelming and you can only examine it in small pieces because otherwise you would just never think about anything else ever. Um, so if that was the point, I guess it worked, but I don't think that for me made this a, a brilliant book. And I had similar feelings with Dominicana by Angie Cruz, which is a book that ends up feeling very directionless, which may very well be intentional because our protagonist doesn't feel like she has any agency. She isn't able to grab the plot, her own narrative and say, right, well, I wanna go over here. She doesn't have the power to do that. But 
if a book is going to use a device like that in order to make us feel as the character feels, in a way make this book feel like it's going round and round in circles because that's what she's doing, it needs to be balanced out in other ways, like it needs to have extraordinary writing in it, I need to feel like I really understand these characters and get down to their core so that those things that frustrate the characters don't end up frustrating me as a reader. This book also is attempting to have a discussion on colorism but because it doesn't go into any depth I'm not really sure what she was trying to say and that didn't particularly work out for me at all. It does feel as though she starts lots of topics and it is a, a fascinating look at immigration but then she's also trying to talk about the civil rights movement but then doesn't really do that either. So it just sits somewhere in the middle and um, that balancing act, as I said, just didn't really work out in the end. There was A Thousand Ships by Natalie Haynes, which I know is so beloved, especially by Anna over at A Case for Books. I know that Jean loves it too. I enjoyed this book, which is a, a kind of choral retelling of um, Troy and the Trojan War, but from the women's perspectives, and those perspectives obviously were not in ancient writing, and they have often been neglected. I much preferred this to Pat Barker's book The Silence of the Girls which was shortlisted for the Women's Prize last year and explored very similar territory but ultimately this just I think isn't my cup of tea it's not the kind of book that I love and um, I feel really daunted and overwhelmed just being honest here coming into a book like this which has a list of characters at the front telling you who everybody is and their relationship to everybody else my knowledge of Greek myth classics is actually I would say quite small and um, I often find that people expect me to have a really large knowledge of those topics because I have a in-depth knowledge about fairy tales and there is some crossover and they share some uh, etymological rootings and I have researched individual fairy tales from the Greek myth um, and how that canon works but overall for instance the Odyssey, the Iliad, I've tried to read before and I just, I, I, they're not really my thing, I don't think, which is obviously absolutely fine. Um, but when it comes to this, it means I feel like I'm doing a lot of groundwork as I go. Um, my enjoyment, I feel it just seeping out of me slightly. So there's nothing wrong with this book at all. I think it's very well written. And I love how we open with our muse who Homer is calling on to sing. And she's like, for God's sake, I've been singing all this time. You're just not listening. Uh, I really like the commentary when it comes to that, but it's just not a book that, that I loved. I am not the audience for it, I think is what I'm saying. And also, let's talk about Hilary Mantel for a second, shall we? So, um, this is not the one that is shortlisted for the Women's Prize, it is the third one, which is The Mirror and the Light. This is her Thomas Cromwell trilogy. There's this, Bring Up the Bodies, and The Mirror and the Light. And it's about Thomas Cromwell and Henry VIII, and it is about his wives, and all of the in-depth political discussions that go on with the uh, many people who he falls out with. This series I have tried to read before. I've tried to read Wolf Hall on several occasions and I've always given up. It's such a, um, such a rich, dense book. And again, every time I read it, I'm like, oh, this is so well written. Why don't I love this? And I'm always frustrated that I don't love it because I want to love it so much. And I could have gone into the third book to review all of the women's prize books, but I felt like it would be doing a little bit of a disservice to the trilogy. So I said, no, I am going to read Wolf Hall again, and then I'm gonna work my way through all three. But it's just not for me. I did finish Wolf Hall this time. I got all the way to the end and I could have continued and I could have read the next two, but I think my response would have been the same and that I don't think that it's for me. If I have to describe it to you, okay, the way that I feel about this trilogy, and I hope that some other people feel the same, is that I feel like I'm walking through an amazing art gallery where there are so many true to life paintings of people from the 1500s and I'm standing looking at them and thinking I am so in awe of this person's talent that they have managed to capture the essence of who these people were. I can believe in them. I think that the person who has created these things is actually a bit of a genius but it's not quite my style of art. I don't particularly want to stay until closing time. I don't want to buy a painting and take it home and put it on my wall. I'm just, you know, I'm very happy to look at it for a while and then maybe buy something I don't need from the gift shop and go home early. And that's how I feel about the Cromwell trilogy. And it makes my heart kind of sad because so many people love it and I want to get in on that love fest and I just, 
just don't feel it in my soul. Sorry. And let's talk about a book that did get into my soul and made a happy home there. And that is This Green and Pleasant Land by Aisha Malik. And I want to start a petition to get this to be a Sunday evening TV series or a film in the vein of Pride. If you like the film Pride, I think you're gonna like that. It has that same vibe to it. So this is about a quaint English village called Babel's End. And when I say quaint, I mean there's lots of cute things about it, but there's a hell of a lot of racism in it too. And um, it's mainly focused on Bilal and his family who live in this village. And Bilal's mother passes away at the beginning of this book and her dying wish, much to Bilal's horror, is that she wants him to build a mosque in their village. This village that is so set in its ways and this village that has two churches that actually don't have loads of people going to it anyway. This place where he feels like he's rooted himself and he has assimilated and he has um, silenced parts of himself in order to make his life easier. And because he's internalized so many things, he's cross about this because that's the kind of weight that he's taken on in the sense that if another Muslim family moved to the village and they said they wanted to set up a mosque, he would say, excuse me, but I have silenced myself. Can't you just silence yourself in order to make everything just calm and peaceful? So he has to unearth himself and quite literally actually, because he decides to build a grave in his back garden and go and lie in it so that he can um, really feel grounded. I feel like I'm coming up with all these puns unintentionally. So he's grounding himself in the ground, building his own grave, thinking about what truly matters to him. Bilal is part of the local committee and they meet in the church hall and discuss um, local issues. The amount of passive aggressive notes that go between people is hilarious. If you've ever had any issues with your neighbours or people on your street, then um, you will you will laugh at this quite a lot. For instance, one of the notes is sent from Shelley, who is Bilal's neighbor who everyone thinks must have a great life but actually she's very miserable and she deflects that onto everybody else um she sends tom who's recently gone through a bereavement this ridiculous note saying i'm so sorry for your loss but if you don't trim the bush outside your house i will have to come and trim your bush for you and this escalates into something explosive. This book at the beginning paints people with quite broad strokes, almost like they come across as caricatures, and that's because that's the way they present themselves to the world. People see them as this quite simple outline, and it's not until we get into the book and start chipping away at this really fake, you know, smile that everyone's putting on that we get to see who these people really are and what they're hiding below the surface. And some people come together, some people don't. There's lots of discussion on racism and homophobia and what it means to have a home and, and faith and really re-examining yourself and how you want to present yourself to the world and what you want to fight for. I thought this book was an absolute delight and I would heartily recommend it. Earlier this month I did a 24 hour reading vlog and in that I read a few different books so I'm gonna briefly hold them up here and show you but if you would like to hear my thoughts on them you can go over and watch that video afterwards. I read this picture book which is called The Invisible Bear by Cecile Metzger. This is translated from French. I don't know who the translator is because unfortunately they're not listed in this book which I, I don't think is okay actually. Um, I enjoyed the I know I said I wasn't gonna talk about them, but very briefly, I enjoyed the illustration in this book, but I didn't think that the the movement between the spreads was as clear as I would have hoped it to have been for its target audience. I also read Outsiders, which is a collection of short stories. I have one of my short stories in here, and this is a collection about um, queerness. It is about disability. It is about um, many different things. There's an amazing story in here about a racist haunted house. There's a story in here about a world where people change their skins at night. I loved it. Highly biased because I have a story in here myself, but everyone else's stories in here I thought were amazing. Um, and I also read People From My Neighbourhood by Hiromi Kurakami, which is translated from the Japanese by Ted Goosen. And I adored this so much so that I have since bought two more of her books. This is a series of flash fiction, high on magical realism. I thought it was charming. If you wanna know my in-depth thoughts, head over to that other video. 
I read Barbara Kingsolver's How to Fly in 10,000 Easy Lessons. This is her debut poetry collection, though, as I'm sure you know, she's a novelist with a very impressive backlist who lots of people love. I've actually never read any of her novels. I do have some over on my shelf over here. This was an unsolicited review copy and I filmed a video where I read the beginning of some unsolicited review copies that have been sent to me to see if they were my cup of tea. And whilst I don't think ultimately that this book is a favourite of mine at all, because as I mentioned in that video, I, I feel like these poems are a little bit too sculpted, a little bit too perfect. It feels as though they've lost a little bit of, of magic. They, they don't move, they feel too rigid. But there are some poems in here that I think are wonderful. And obviously this is a style of poetry that many people love. I would compare it to Wendy Cope. I would compare it to Don Patterson. Um, some of the poems in here remind me of Sharon Old's collection, Odes, which I really do love. I think my favorite in here is a poem called, which I'm obviously not gonna be able to find now. I want it to magically present itself to me. Here it is, it's called Cage of Heaven and it begins, watching the polar bear in his enclosure. I'm thinking of Emily Dickinson, her fine feet pacing the floors of her house, the white dress dragging delicately out the kitchen door over the circular paths of the backyard whose perimeters she would not leave for decades to the end. We are all beasts born to our burdens whether by law or the rifle, sharp crack or sanity of a spine, enclosure is waiting. This white bear with his splayed paws parting the water like heavy drapes was not plucked from some wild perfect life but orphaned, born by trauma into this or nothing. I thought that image of this polar bear coupled with Emily Dickinson was just brilliant. So yeah, there, there are some things in here that really shine through for me, but, but her style as a whole is not generally what I, what I love in poetry. Um, I also read the Prose Poem Project. In the 24 hour reading vlog I was going through old literary journals where I'd had pieces published and I was reading various things and this is something that I read in full afterwards um, because I've been getting more into prose poetry which I read a lot of a long time ago um, but hadn't read much of since um, and I, I'm so sad that this journal does not exist anymore because I think that it's kind of brilliant. In reading this, I did come across a poet whose work I had never read before. She's called Alexandra Vanterkamp. So I've ordered her poetry collection and I'll review that and talk about it soon. But I just wanted to read you the beginning of this poem so you can hear how brilliant it is. It's called Nine Steps on How to Survive Yourself. When you start taking yourself too seriously, think of whales, the dark secrets of water they swim through, the envelopes of ocean they open with their toothless bristled mouths, Read a poem in which you learn baleen whales were hunted once for those bristled mouths. The coarse hairs used for corsets, umbrellas, brushes and brooms. The hardware of a whale's mouth living among men and women whenever it rained, whenever a woman brushed her hair or breathed out. Think of your own hair. How, when you moved from your last apartment, you had to sweep the corners of floors and were amazed at its persistence. The dusty strands and S's curling around chair legs, the wild grasses swaying beneath beds, the skies of it clouding over doors and portholes, the shy locks clinging to the edges of night tables and beds. If that doesn't work, say corset 5,000 times until it morphs into core, or galore, an ocean of sound much larger than you could ever worry about. Try not to panic if the evening turns a bitter, abrupt green, if the clouds are bruised apples tumbling towards you and you fear you won't be able to catch a world wider than you. It goes on because it's quite a long poem, but I just think it's brilliant and I'm very excited to read her book. I read a few collections of fairy tales this month for research. So I read one of Chronicle's books. This is Tales from India. They have a few different ones, Tales from Japan. Um, what other ones do they have? Tales from East Africa. They're all so beautifully illustrated. This one isn't credited with an author because I think they've just pulled from um, much older texts. And because of that, the writing in this, I don't think is is brilliant, but I love reading the stories and the illustrations are stunning. Let me, well, this is the end papers. Look at that, amazing. Um, and let me find you one of the plates. Here is one of those plates. The illustrations in here are done by Savu Kohli and Viblot Singh, um, and I cannot fault the illustrations at all. I also read Chinese fairy tales and legends and this is written it says by Richard Wilhelm and Frederick H Martins and it says that because Richard has written a new introduction to this text which was originally published by Frederick about a hundred years ago so he's trying to contextualize 
everything. I thoroughly enjoyed reading this. It was great for research and splits them into lots of different themes. I also read this collection of Indonesian fairy tales, which I'm very grateful to have read um, if we're talking on a research basis because I came across tales I'd never heard of before, but the illustration style is not quite my taste. It's called The Tiny Boy and Other Tales from Indonesia and it's retold by Merti Banata. Speaking of illustration that is to my taste though, I read and adored this, which is a picture book and it's called How the Stars Came to Be by Poonam Mystery. Um, and they have done both the text and the illustrations. I do think that the illustrations in this book are so much stronger than the text, but I'm actually going to forgive it because the illustrations are so beautiful it's ridiculous. I'm gonna do a cutaway here so you can see how outstanding they are. This is a folklore story about how the stars came to be and if you enjoy Coralie Bickford Smith's style of art then you will adore this too. Speaking of fairy tales, this is not a collection of fairy tales that I read for research because this is a new set of fairy tales. It's called Queer Folk Tales which is a great play on words because it's queer folk tales and also queer folk tales. Great. And this is by Kevin Walker, who is a storyteller. So he goes around into libraries and at book festivals and he performs stories. I would say you can tell that when reading this because I think they would be all the more vibrant if he was there and telling them to you. They have that very, um, I mean this in a positive way, they have a very simple storytelling style to them which works well if we're talking about theatre and if we're talking about bedtime stories it means also that they feel so authentic when it comes to thinking about fairy tales of old it feels like rewriting fairy tale history in order to include queer characters which is just what I wanted this book to be because we have all been done such a disservice I didn't even say that word properly we have all been such a disservice we have been done such a disservice by having so many queer fairy tales removed from our canon and not written down and published. Um, and I've spoken about that in, in my fairy tale series that I do on this channel. So I will link that in the description box down below. Unfortunately, my favorite story in this was the first one, but I really love that story so much. It's about a, a young man who really wants to work at the palace and he falls in love with the prince and he just wants to get close to the prince and he can't think of how to do that. So he asks the world, please let me get close to the prince. And so he's turned into a poppy flower and then the chef uses the seeds from the flower that he's been turned into and bakes him into bread and he gets to be eaten by the prince. There's some very sexual undertones in that which are just delightful and also it's just so funny that he's so happy that that's the way he gets to live his life, to be baked into bread and be eaten by the man that he loves. I, I loved that, I thought it was delightful. There were some stories in here that I, I wasn't really sure if they belonged in the collection in the sense that they weren't really fairy tales so he has a, um, a retelling of Dorian Gray in here, um, but it, that didn't feel particularly innovative. It was just highlighting Oscar Wilde's queerness, which is of course a very valid thing to do and something that we should talk about more, but it didn't really feel suited to this book. Um, something I did appreciate was, let me find it, because it has, um, it has some commentary from the author before or after talking about how he came to write the story or where he's told it or a particular memory tied with it and, and that made the whole collection feel really personal I love that and there was one in particular sorry I realize it's getting so dark in here let me turn on a few more lights I don't think that turning on that light helped in the slightest sorry okay so in this book there's a story called the kingdom across the sea and it's based on an old fairy tale where a woman doesn't want to marry a man so she runs away from her family disguising herself as a man in order to feel protected in society and not to be um, kidnapped on the road and then she comes across a woman who takes her into her family and she falls in love with this woman but she says, I can't be with this person because they think that I'm a man and I'm not. So they plead with the universe to turn her into a man so that she can have this heteronormative happy ending with the woman that she loves. And that's the happy ending. So in this book, Kevin rewrites that so that she doesn't have to wish to be a man so that two women can be together and find love. But at the end of that, he writes in his notes that he acknowledges that whilst he thought that he was celebrating two women loving each other and doing that, he realized that he was erasing an ending that could have been really empowering to trans people. So he says, please select the endings that you, know, you see yourselves in and that you want to celebrate. And he's passing on 
that evolution of fairy tales and encouraging you to do that yourself and I thought that that was that was really great. I read this which is published by Strangers Press. They have a whole series of Japanese translated fiction, one of Korean translated fiction. I'm slowly making my way through all of them. This is one of their Japanese titles which is called Makamari and it's by Mitsumi Kobo translated into English by Polly Barton. This is about a schoolboy who goes to a comic convention and he becomes infatuated with this married woman who's there. She wants to have a relationship with him and she gives him a script to follow out and costumes to wear. So she is completely directing their relationship and telling him what to do. And sometimes he likes that and sometimes he doesn't. It's obviously a massive abuse of power, but he's very confused because he's seeing this exaggerated over the top anime version of women's sexuality, particularly this woman's sexuality and how he feels about it. But then at home, his mother is a midwife and throughout the day she's delivering babies in their home and he often has to help out with that. So he's seeing these two vastly different sides of womanhood and trying to reconcile how he feels about these things. Um, it, it's, it's an explosion, I suppose, into adulthood. Um, and he's feeling very overwhelmed and manipulated by both of these things but also wanting to understand. I just thought so much is covered in this tiny little book and I enjoyed it very much. And finally for Women in Translation Month another series of books I read is these which is called Translating Feminisms and they're published by Tilted Axis Press. So these are a series of poetry pamphlets that are put together by various different people exploring, exploring? exploring um, the way that feminism is written about in different parts of the world. So we have this pamphlet, which is a collection of four Tamil poets, which is edited and um, collated by Meena Kandasamy, who's the author of When I Hit You, which was shortlisted for the Women's Prize a couple of years ago. Um, the poems in here, I, I enjoyed. There was one that I really loved the main image of, which is called Light is a Prowling Cat opening the door noiselessly, light puts out a hand hesitantly, wondering if it's still raining. Seeing that the rain has gone, it spreads out its shadow shop upon the clustering trees, then climbs up the tent face to sit and watch the world. I love this idea of light of daybreak coming out and making sure it's safe to creep out like a cat. I just thought that was brilliant. And what I particularly love about these series is the way that um, the translators lead the discussion. So at the beginning, they're talking about how they translated the work and why. There was one pamphlet out of the four that I didn't particularly love, and it was this one, which is Night by Sulachana Mandahar, which is translated by Mona Karung. She is a writer from Nepal. And the writing style is just, it is not particularly to my taste, but I really love the discussion on translation in here because she said that she thought about translating it all in the night because this is a collection about what night means and how you can reclaim the night by writing in a time when you're supposed to be silent if your voice is not particularly valued during the day. And so the translator wanted to try and translate these in the middle of the night. So she was in this in-between state between being awake and asleep and she thought that would help her connect with the words. But then she realized that that probably wasn't gonna work because she wasn't thinking properly and she needed to be very alert. But I loved that uh, explanation of all the experiments she went through in order to translate these poems. Moon Fevers by Na Twin is translated from the Vietnamese by Caitlin Rees. In these poems, it's a, it's a look at the evolution of self and any time the pronoun I is used, it's put in brackets. It feels almost like an omission of self, a hiding of self or a protection of self. It's such a simple thing, but you can interpret it in so many different ways. And if it's an omission of self and you remove the I from the poem, it changes it and changes it from being a poem about them, the narrator, to being instructions to the reader. So if you include the I, it says, I look at mum, hold tongue, she sleeps broken ground. I look at her without being seen. But if you remove the I, it says, look at mum, hold tongue, she sleeps broken ground. Look at her without being seen, mum's gaping mouth. So it's telling you to do those things. Um, you can look at the brackets if we're talking about it as an evolution of self, like it's a coffin, uh, a preserving, 
or you could read it as a cocoon and that the eye, which is always in lower caps as well, is growing unseen and ready to blossom into something else like a butterfly. I thought that was really wonderful. I think my favourite out of the four is this one here, which is an anthology, a very short anthology of poems. It's called Against Healing, which is edited and translated from Korean by Emily Jungmin Yun. And I discovered some poets in here whose work I hadn't read before. And there are poems in here about um, motherhood, about abortion, about abuse, about girlhood. One of my favourites is this one called Single Mum, which is by uh, Shin Yun Rim, and it begins, Do you know how many times roses bloomed this year? Due to abnormal temperatures, they bloomed then died off four times. I'm not afraid of typhoons coming frequently due to abnormal temperatures. The difference between my baby and the bomb is whether I want to hold it to my bosom or not. Mummy can't stop man-made distractions like war or the Daegu disaster, but mummy can float the elephant you drew into the sky. Mummy can make a bowl of rice with her tears. Mummy can start a riot of hope until her batteries run out. I loved the process of reading these four pamphlets. I loved analysing the poems. I loved discovering new voices of poets whose work I would like to go and seek out, see if they've been translated elsewhere too. I loved the discussion on translation at the beginning of each of these four pamphlets, specifically the conundrum on how do you amplify women's voices when you're translating them into other languages? How do you make sure you're not accidentally silencing them by changing a meaning? How do you make sure that you're not filtering their idea of feminism into uh, into this box that you have created for them into something that makes the most sense to you instead of what they actually meant in the first place? How do you juggle all of those things? I would really recommend this series. Um, so those are all the books that I read in August, quite a few. As I said, I'll list them in the description box down below if you want to go and check them out anywhere. I would love to know what you have been reading recently. Let me know in a comment down below. Let me know if you're interested in reading any of these too. And I will see you all in a new video very soon. Lots of love. Bye.